Okay, so the next form of validity that we are going to talk about is this idea of statistical conclusion validity. Um, and this is the idea that um, you just want to make sure that your, st your statistics and your analysis is correct. Um, and there are a whole bunch of different ways that your analysis itself can go wrong. Um, you can have typos in your code, sure. Um, we've talked about that um, when we talked about reproducibility and errors that can be introduced with Excel um, or other things where you have typos and it's distorting um, your actual results. So that's important. Um, but beyond just human error, there are a whole bunch of other statsy ways that your results can go wrong. And we'll talk about each of these um, briefly after I list them here. Um, you can have issues with statistical power. Um, you can violate assumptions of statistical tests. You can engage in phishing and p-hacking. And then finally, you can just have spurious statistical significance and see that there's a relationship and assume that it's true, um, but it might not be. Um, so we'll talk about each of these in turn here. So this idea of statistical power is in order to find an effect and detect an effect, you need to have enough data to be able to see that effect and, and recognize it. Um, so let's pretend that there's some sort of employment training program that's designed to boost people's incomes um, by some amount. And through magic in the time machine or whatever, you know that this program is supposed to cause on average $40 of an increase in incomes um, because you, you know what the true treatment effect is. So you collect a data set um, with 400 different people in it. Um, you have a randomized control trial with a treatment group and a control group. Um, you measure their incomes before and after and you can measure their difference and then you're gonna take the average and figure out what the, what the effect is. So we know it should be 40. Um, but we care about significance testing. We want to see if um, this difference that we measure is part of one of those null worlds where there's no actual effect or if it doesn't fit well in a world where there's no effect. And if it doesn't fit well in a world where there's no effect, that means it is significant and it's probably not zero and it's probably something, uh, some true value. So... Let's imagine you take a survey of people who participated in this program, um, both in the treatment group and the control group, and you survey 10 participants because um, you don't have enough time to, to track down everybody. Um, so you just figure we'll take five people in the treatment group, five people in the control group, call that good. Um, so if you do a statistical test, um, like a t-test, a difference in means test here, and this is essentially what you'll find. This red line here is the measured difference in averages. And it's about 40. That's what we want it to be. That's what the true effect is. But this histogram in the background is a simulated world where there's no difference um, between treatment and control based on the data that we've collected. So those 10 people, we basically take their existing, um, the recorded um, before and after incomes, subtract them, but then we shuffle them around 10,000 times to kind of simulate a world where there's no difference, we're wiping out that difference. And in this world where there's no difference, you could have um, a difference between treatment and control of negative $200. Sometimes you'll have it up to $200. Um, mostly it's going to be clustered around between negative 100 and 100. So if you, like, that is the world where there's no effect. Um, and so if we measure an effect of $40, um, can we distinguish that $40 from this world where there's no effect? No, that $40 fits comfortably in a world where there's no actual true effect. And so this is statistically not significant. If you look at the p-value here, it's 0.09. There's a there's an 89% chance that you would see this um, red line, this $40, in a world where there's no difference. Um, and so we can't conclude anything about this study. We don't know if there's an actual effect. If we boost our um, sample size here from 10 to um, 200, the, the whole analysis changes. Um, here's our null world where there's no effect. Um, but now instead of ranging from like negative 200 to 200, it's ranging from negative 20 to 20. The reason that shrunk down is because we have a lot more points of data. And so we can see more accurately what this null world would look like. Um, so the interval that we have around zero has shrunken. Um, so we still measure um, this $38 difference. Again, the true value is 40. Um, we don't, we didn't, 
um, survey every single person. This is just half of the people. So we're, we're guessing it's about 38. Cool. Um, so does this red line here fit nicely in this world where there's no difference? And it doesn't. It's kind of way out here to the side. Um, it's no longer here clustered in the middle. And so the probability of seeing something like 38 in a world where there is actually no difference between treatment and control, that's very, very improbable. The p-value is less than 0 0.001. Um, the chance that you would see this in a world where there's no difference is basically zero, which means um, we can be fairly confident that this is not zero um, and that there is a positive effect from this program. The only difference between um, this side here and the 200 side here is the sample size. Um, it's the same participants. This was just 10 of them, and this is 200 of them. And so it really does matter how big your um, sample size is when you're doing these kinds of studies. Um, if you're trying to find the effect of some program and you only have enough money to survey 50 people, you're probably not going to find an effect. Um, you also don't necessarily need to survey thousands and thousands and thousands of people. Um, when they do presidential polling, for instance, um, you've probably noticed that they always report the sample size. And generally, the sample size is like 1,200 or 1,800 or maybe like 2,200 or something. They never do a sample size of like 500,000 people because there's no need to do that. Um, the way this statistical power idea works is... Um, you generally want to, to get a big enough sample size where it shrinks your null world down to something more reasonable. And then when you pick something up, when you measure some effect like here, um, you're fairly confident that it's not going to be in this null world here. So the whole goal of statistical power is to, to find the right number of um, observations in a data set to make it so that you can detect this effect here. Um, it's, the, it's basically the same effect that we see over in this world here with the 10 participants, but the issue is we don't have enough statistical power to see it. Um, that null world is too big. So adding more observations shrinks that null world and makes it more detectable. And that's the whole goal of statistical power here. Which raises the question, how big of a sample should you have? Um, and there are mathy ways of figuring this out. Um, one of your readings for today was um, all about statistical power. There were 10 um, frequently asked questions. It had a calculator built into that reading. Um, you can also just go to Google and search for statistical power calculator. There are a ton out there. Um, for the sake of this class, I'm not gonna have you memorize formulas or memorize how to calculate this power stuff. Um, just know that you can find a calculator um, and then you can use those calculators to say, um, this is how big of an effect I think will exist in the world. Um, and here's how many people I'm thinking about surveying. Is that enough to potentially find that effect um, given the people I'm surveying? And it will generally give you kind of the ideal number um, to be able to detect an effect as big as you think might be out there. Um, and this is what um, presidential polling um, companies use um, to figure out how many people they need to survey. Um, this is what you should use when you run actual studies. Um, try to figure out kind of a good number based on these statistical formulas here to be able to detect an effect um, and shrink down that null world so it is detectable. Um, and so that's the whole goal of the sample size stuff. If you don't have a correct sample size, then you're going to have issues with statistical um, conclusion validity, and you're not going to be able to um, use the statistics the way you want. So sample size is really important. Um, another form of um, statistical validity is this idea of test assumptions. Um, in your past stats classes, you learned all about the different assumptions and kind of the checklists that you have to use before you use statistical tests. In order to use a t-test, you need to check to see if the groups have equal variance. You need to check to see a whole bunch of other prerequisites, and then you get to choose the right t-test. Um, and you probably went through, you had probably had to memorize a whole like flow chart of which test to, to use. Um, when you use linear regression, for instance, um, for using OLS, ordinary least, ordinary least squares regression, you have to make sure that the relationship between X and Y is linear. Um, you have to make sure that there's homoscedasticity, which means the error terms, the leftover parts of your model that aren't predicted by your X variables. Um, there has to be no patterns in the error terms. Um, 
the the different x variables have to be independent and they can't be collinear. You don't want multicollinearity. And then um, your x variables need to be normally distributed. Um, and your y variable sometimes has to be normally distributed as well. So in order to run just a normal regression using stata or r or whatever, um, it's really tempting to just use lm or type reg in stata and run a regression. But technically, you're supposed to check to make sure your regression meets all of these assumptions first. Um, and if it doesn't, then whatever results come out of the regression could be wrong. Um, and then your conclusions will be wrong. So moral of the story here is make sure you're doing the stats correctly um, if you want to have statistical conclusion validity. Um, a third way of, of losing the statistical conclusion validity, and a thing that's really, really tempting, um, especially nowadays because we have computers that can do all sorts of fast calculations, um, and we have big data sets with lots of columns, is it is super tempting to just um, run a loop, essentially, in R or Stata or whatever, and go through every possible combination of columns in your data set um, and find the ones that explain your outcome variable the best um, and have the most significance and have the, the best model fit. Um, you can do this. Um, there's There are functions in R that will essentially, like you build a whole bunch of models and it'll go through and it'll tell you what's the best one. Um, and what has the highest R squared and what has the most significant coefficients. Don't do that. Um, because our goal here with science, um, especially with causal inference science, is to not, we're not trying to predict. Um, this does happen sometimes in the machine learning world, um, where if Netflix is trying to guess your next show, they have hundreds of thousands of columns about different people's viewing habits. Um, they just shove them all in a model and a whole bunch of different models. They build something called an ensemble model, where they just have hundreds and thousands of different models that they kind of combine and it spits out a prediction. They don't care what the effect of individual columns is. They just want to get the best prediction. And so in that case, that can happen where you're just kind of iterating through a bunch of different models, seeing which one fits the best. Um, but if you care about the actual coefficients, which we do, we care about the effect of one of our x's on our outcome, um, like the program on the outcome. You don't want to just kind of throw a whole bunch of variables together and hope it sticks. Um, that is wrong. Um, that is bad for science. It's something called p-hacking, um, where you're trying to get a good p-value. And the, the interactive... Um, activity that I had you do for the readings this week from 538 here um, lets you practice that, where you could find your own relationship between um, um, different, uh, like which political party is in power and the economy, um, by just choosing different levels of uh, politicians to include in the model, different time periods, different other variables that you could throw in there. And so your, your goal there was to just like choose a whole bunch of stuff until a p-value looked good, and then you can publish it. That's wrong and bad. Um, so ways around this, um, one modern way is to um, essentially pre-register your hypothesis and say, I think that based on these variables, if we include these because the DAG says to control for these backdoors and close these backdoors and make sure the relationship is isolated, I think that if we do that, there will be a positive effect of X on Y. And then you write that down somewhere and you post it on the internet and you say, this is what I think. Then you run your analysis and see if it's right. Um, it's really tempting to then start controlling for other stuff until it turns out to be right. But again, that's distorting science. That's basically redrawing the DAG until you get the results that you want. Don't do that. Um, for your final project, what you're essentially doing is pre-registering a hypothesis. Um, you're working with fake data, simulated data, so that you can do whatever p-hacking you want beforehand before you hit the real data. Once you get the real data, don't mess with different parameters and, and, and tinker with stuff until you get a good p-value. Um, that's bad. So we're working with the simulated data, so you kind of have a little bit more leeway if you see that the model's not working because um, one of the variables might be too big or it's, it doesn't fit well, then you can kind of more safely mess around with it, but you're not touching real data yet. Um, as soon as you hit the real data world, don't fish around for the results that you want or don't p-hack um, because that leads to bad science and bad findings.
Um, the final type of statistical conclusion validity that we care about is this idea of spurious statistical significance. And this is just the idea that probability is weird. Um, so we have this p threshold that we keep talking about, this 0.05. And so if a p value is less than 0.05, then it's statistically significant. Neat. Um, the thing with this 0.05 threshold is that that is the same as 19 or as 1 out of 20. Um, and so if you measure something randomly, like some 20 random variables that you, you measure, um, the relationship between those, if you measure them a whole bunch of different times and different relationships, one of them has, there's a 5% chance that there's going to be an effect um, just by chance. Um, and that's the, that's the whole point of, of um, probability here. And so if you measure 20 different outcomes or the relationships between 20 different variables, even if there's no relationship at all, there's a 5% chance you're going to find a relationship just by chance. Um, and so that can mess up your findings. Um, this is why I had you do this reading here from XKCD, um, where it has these two scientists looking at the relationship between jelly bean color and acne. And they discover... Um, by chance that there's a link between green jelly beans and acne because the p-value is less than 0.05. That less than 0.05 just came up because of chance. They're doing a whole bunch of different um, correlations here, and one of them just happens to be less than 0.05 because probability says that's going to happen. And then often you'll see published results based on these spurious correlations or spurious significance numbers, um, and then that's bad. So how do you know if the p-value that you find is real or spurious? Uh, you don't necessarily. Um, one way to do it is to keep um, measuring it in different ways and run different types of models to see if the relationship holds up or if it just goes away if you start adding other coefficients. Um, and make sure the DAG is written um, correctly and drawn um, with all the arrows in the right ways. Um, and so generally, you just want to make sure the study is built the best way possible. There's always going to be a chance that it's going to be wrong. Um, if your P threshold there is, is 0.05, then you have a 95% chance that you'll that it'll be right, I guess. Um, but sometimes you'll see low p-values just appear because that's just the nature of probability. So it's something to watch out for. Um, there's no magic statistical test that tells you if a p-value is real or not. You just have to keep investigating it and poking it and see if it, it stays small or if it goes big or if it's um, kind of robust. Um, so that is statistical conclusion validity, a whole bunch of different statsy things that can happen to your study um, and to your analysis to make it go wrong. Um, and so you should care about these things. And um, as you're doing your analysis, make sure um, it meets all of these different standards and doesn't get messed up.